I don't want to be that guy on the bus, you know, 200 days a year, eating PB and J, staying at Super 8 motels, you know, like it didn't sound appealing. That sounds though. great to me. I don't know. Why does that not appeal to you? That sounds amazing to me. <laughs> My next guest on Soup with Coop is, according to my daughter and my wife, the best looking person I will ever interview in my life. So I apologize to your former teammate, Nick Mangold, we've interviewed. I know he thought he was there taking the guest uh, last on number one, but Eric Decker, welcome to Soup with Coop. Wow, I appreciate having me on. I was, I, I was thinking Eli was maybe gonna be uh, before Nick, but Nick does have that sexy beard, so I get it. Well, Eli well, has never returned my call, so he's never been interviewed. <laughs> he's very elusive right now in retirement, you know? Uh, I imagine he's taking his time and enjoying it. What kind of soup are you having today? I got a little wild rice soup. Um, actually, it's, it's in my wife's cookbook. I made her put it in there because this is kind of a Northern thing, in, in my opinion. Uh, growing up in Minnesota, we passed the wild rice fields, going to the lakes, and this, is, this has been a staple. Uh, for me growing up. You know, when you talk, the only word you said there that makes you sound like you're from Minnesota was Minnesota. Every other word, I think you've been, I think you've gotten like TV lessons or something because you sound like you're from nowhere now. And I'm, I think yeah. <laughs> your fellow Minnesotans, your classmates are probably not proud of that. It's gone. There's, there's words though, pop, you know, uh, uh, roof, there's some words that it comes out, but I think, yeah, I've been trained to be kind of Switzerland in the sense of my, my speaking uh, dialect. I was in Minnesota this summer and I was driving to this lake to meet a friend who had invited me. And I kind of got the two, I said, I, I want all the, the dialect, give it to me. I want to be able to use it. I want to try to fit in. And the one I really, the two I really like is, don't you know? Don't you know, eh? <laughs> and you betcha, you betcha. You betcha. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. You betcha. Oh, man. You know what? I went back to myself um, in August and you kind of forget sometimes when, you know, it's uh, months go by and especially being in the South, it's just it's a different, again, uh, different speech in that sense. And it's like, wow, you know, like it's, it's I love it. You know, it's just a good old. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, of course. You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> Now, did you eat a lot of soup growing up? And do you still eat a lot of soup? Yeah, soup for me, like during the winter was, like I was saying, a staple. We, uh, so when I was in college, went to University of Minnesota. I grew up about an hour and a half northwest of the Twin Cities. And um, that was, there was two things I had my mom bring me on a weekly basis. It was wild rice soup and chili. So I don't know if you put chili into soup, but it was just hearty, you know, good warm food that kind of got me through the, the really cold winters <laughs> that you experience in Minnesota. Now, growing up in Minnesota, Minnesota, you know, it's not known for a, producing a ton of athletes into the college ranks in the NFL. Were you a dominant guy in fifth grade, sixth grade? So were you always kind of the best athlete? Because I mean, to make it in the NFL for Minnesota is, is saying something. It's not a laundry list. I was looking at all the players from Louisiana in the Super Bowl. There are like 11 players with Louisiana ties. Minnesota wow. had one, which I was kind of glad to see. But, uh, Johnson, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, so I was tiny up until 10th grade. I, I had about a six or seven inch growth spurt over the summer going into my junior year. And I was just so competitive. I think that was the biggest thing. I, I grew up going to the baseball park, the amateur baseball park in town every day. And, you know, whether it was doing the scoreboard, um, whether it was, you know, shaking fall balls and playing, we call the game butts up. And so it's, it's basically throwing a racquetball against the wall and you got to feel the ball cleanly. Otherwise you got to run and take the wall without someone pegging you before you get there. And so I'm, you know, I'm eight years old playing with 13, 14 year olds and I'm just getting beat. Like I'm getting dominated. I got welts coming home, I'm bleeding. And so it kind of, I think trained me just that competitiveness and just, you know, just to keep going and resilience. And um, yeah, I think in high school, there was definitely a sense of dominance, but when I got to college, I mean, I was from a very small school. And so I had a red shirt. It was a, you know, transition time for me. Um, 
But what got me through was just, I think that, that mindset, you know, that like, I'm going to outwork everybody. And so that was really, I think what gave me the opportunity to, to play in the professional league. Now in high school, you were a very good athlete, obviously baseball, basketball, football. Did you always have a favorite? I loved high school basketball. I think just, you know, the, the smaller gyms and people packed in, you, you can't beat that environment. Um, and I think ultimately baseball was my favorite sport. I grew up twins fan. Kirby Puckett was like my idol. Um, I always wanted to play professional baseball. That was my dream. That's what, you know, every day I'd have my bat and my ball be visualizing robbing a home run like Curry Puckett used to do back in the day and, and um, got to dabble in it. But, uh, you know, I, I think all of them were, were great sports for me. Were your parents uh, big sports fans? Did they have a big influence on you liking to compete? Yeah, my, my dad's side, um, they all were athletes. So my, my uncle played a little bit in the NFL. My, my dad played collegially. He played multiple, multiple sports. Um, and then my aunt on that side as well played in the professional women's basketball league as well. So they were a very athletic family and very competitive family. And I think, you know, uh, just being around them and kind of have it almost in your genes was, was kind of what drove me. And then being recruited, I probably weren't a big recruit because of the school being smaller. Did you, where, where else did you consider going to college? St. John's university division three school in, uh, St. Joseph, Minnesota, 10 minutes from my hometown. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I'm a little naive when it comes to hockey, but that's a pretty big hockey powerhouse in the in the in the world of hockey gurus. Yeah, I mean hockey. You go to every school in Minnesota. It's uh, it's good. I mean, obviously Duluth down to the Twin Cities, up to yeah St. Cloud, St. Joe, where I'm at, um, Mankato. Every Minnesota team was was good in hockey. I mean, it's the extension of Canada. And that's one thing too, is my high school was so small. We had seven schools combined to make one hockey team. So I was kind of, you know, just disinterested in the sense that you're traveling for practice every, every week to a different school um, to play that. But yeah, everyone grew up playing hockey. Um, it's no secret between us two, Eric, we've talked about this before. My dad got traded to the Vikings late in his career and uh, I was in fifth grade, Peyton was in third, Eli was a, you know, a little whatever, running around in diapers probably, but we moved to Minnesota uh, for his last year in the NFL. And um, it was a pretty big adjustment, go up there just for the fall. My <laughs> mother is from Mississippi, so her <laughs> Southern accent, I mean, it stuck yeah. out like a sore thumb, but we got to play football. That was kind of the bit, I'm like, I'm not going up there, dad. And he's like, look, they're, they have, a high, they have a school, fifth grade football team, tackle football. He had this rule. We couldn't play tackle football to the sixth grade. But there in fifth grade, he kind of bent the rules, and uh, it was green light, and I had a blast up there. Yeah. I love I loved watching people just react to my mother's southern accent. <laughs> oh, I imagine. I mean, it's like a – you know, sticking out like a sore thumb probably up there. Yeah. She was from Mars. You know, go through the line at McDonald's, and, you know, she'd order. And by the time we get to the window, the whole, you know, everybody would be sticking there like, who looks like, talks like this? Who could possibly this? <laughs> so, um, but not unlike the Ducks, when they flew south, but so did my mom. So it got around yeah. Thanksgiving, and we went back to uh, warmer weather. A good, uh, smart move, because it's uh, – as you know, it gets pretty dang cold about December, January in Minnesota. So it was just – Minnesota was your best offer in the world of high so, – Yeah, let me, tell you, let me tell you a story here a little bit. So I, I was kind of a small-town kid that I played, you know, baseball in the summer and did all the, you know, basketball and football activities that, that were offered as well. But I, I, I didn't really want to go to camps, you know, so I, I didn't do any of the – um, college camps around the area or the regional camps that at that time, I don't know who set them up. Um, I just was really comfortable in, in the sense of what I was doing in my hometown. So I got a call from Glenn Mason saying, you need to come just for a one day camp. We just want to evaluate you. He was the head coach of the Gophers at that time. And so I went, offered me a scholarship on the spot. 
And honestly, it just changed my world because I would have been going to a division three school, probably playing baseball and uh, football there. And, and, you know, who knows, I guess at that point where it would have led me to. So very thankful. And I always give, so rivals.com is a buddy who started it living in Nashville. Every time I see him, I give him a hard time about the two stars. I'm like, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't help me in any way of getting more looks. I, I got one scholarship because at that time, Rivals, and still probably is, it was a big platform for coaches. I was, I, was, I saw um, Mac Jones posted an old text he had with the Rivals guys when he was in high school trying to get noticed, like, hey, uh, can you help me out? And he's like, call your local guy. I don't have time for this nonsense. And sure enough, you know, he's making it look easy four or five years later. It's, uh, and that's kind of cool thing about, you know, when you're 17 or, you know, going to be 18 – Nobody, it's hard, it's hard. It's just as hard. It's probably harder for these college guys to evaluate who's who. You can definitely tell who's big and developed and ahead of the curve, but it's really who's a project who's really gonna come on. That's meaningfully harder than trying to figure out who to draft as a general manager in the pros. I mean, that's- And the pool is that much larger. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like, what's the potential of these kids? You know, at college you develop, like you said, I mean, for me, I put on 20 pounds my freshman year in college and I grew a couple inches still. And so it's like definitely was a project in that sense of, of just kind of developing me physically. Now, did you have good quarterbacks at the University of Minnesota? So when I came in, I had Brian Cupido, who was, was pretty good. Um, and then Adam Weber was my quarterback for three years who got a chance. He, he came to Denver for, on the practice squad, bounced around practice squad a few, few times. And he was good uh, and had potential. We had multiple coaching changes. Not, we, we had a new head coach come in, but multiple offense coordinators every year, it was switching them out. And so I think that was such a deterrent to his future because, you know, of the, the change, the constant change that we kept going through. Now you play baseball too. In college. Yeah. How does baseball work in Minnesota? I mean, when does are you out there just in the snow catching fly balls at a you know probably earlier than you should be? We spend a lot of time in our indoor. So the football indoor we used as our primary practice facility. And for the most part, February we would head south, you know, whether it's Florida, Texas, um, California, and would probably play three or four series. Um, just because we couldn't play uh, outside of Minnesota. And, it, you know, you could tell how such a disadvantage of not being, you know, outside taking fly balls and ground balls naturally, um, even, you know, hitting the same thing, you're hitting out of the cage. You're not, you're not playing scrimmages in, in a little, you know, football facility. So it, there, there was uh, definitely some adjustments, but we, we made it work. And now even after I left, we've, they've really upgraded uh, the facilities at Minnesota to kind of compete, I think, with, some of those Southern teams. Football season is here and nothing beats seeing your favorite team live. Not only does Vivid Seats have great NFL ticket prices, they're also the official ticketing partner of ESPN. And with Vivid Seats rewards, when you buy 10 tickets, you get the 11th free. Download the app or visit vividseats.com today. Vivid Seats, life happens live. Receive a reward credit equal to the average price of 10 tickets purchased, excluding taxes, fees, and processing costs. See vividseats.com slash rewards for terms and conditions. Now, as, you, as you're getting further along in your college career, did you ever think, okay, professionally, I might have a better chance playing baseball than football? Did you ever juggle yeah. those? Yeah, I definitely went through that process. And actually, uh, you know, I remember having a conversation with Joe Maurer just because in high school, easy choice to be the first round draft pick at MLB, but he also had a passion for football and had a scholarship offer to Florida state. And it's like, I'm like, what, what, what made you pick baseball? You know? And at that point he didn't know he was going to be a first round draft pick or first overall. Uh, but he just said like, I just love it. Like, this is, this is what I want to do. This is my passion. This is, you know, the direction I want to go. And so I was thinking to myself, like, okay, I love football. I mean, it's a team sport. Uh, there's, there's no highs like football. There's no camaraderie like football. And, um, and then I also thought, okay, I'm not as developed in the baseball world. So I don't want to be that guy on the bus 
you know, 200 days a year eating PB and J stay at super eight motels, you know, like it didn't sound appealing. That sounds like, great to me. I don't know. Why does that not appeal to you? That sounds amazing to me. <laughs> I had a PB and J right before this suit just to kind of soak it up. I mean, coming I'm, I'm home in the summer and getting a summer job just to, you know, make uh means end. And so honestly it was like, okay, lifestyle wise, I wanted the family, want some, some structure in my, in my life. And I was just better developing football. So um, I, I did like talk to scouts and, and go down that direction, but obviously football was, was the better direction for me. Did you go to the combine? Went to the combine. Um, so I got a, a major foot surgery uh, like November of my senior year. So I ran Ohio state and I just made a weird cut had a Liz Frank injury. So basically it was like hardware put all throughout my foot and, Went there, did the Wonder Lake, did the you know interview process, but couldn't compete in terms of you know uh, everything. And I think that's that was not, not a downfall for me, but being obviously a Big Ten white receiver, they yeah. want to see me run, they want to see what, what, what I look like movement wise, and so I, I wasn't able to do that. Or the or the uh, the one at college, um, yeah, pro day. so it, like, it, it was a disadvantage. So you so you never did they have a forty time that they thought you ran at all? I mean, they, they, yeah, they estimated like a, a 40 time for me, just, you know, ballpark, like, oh, what we see on, on film. I, I don't even know how they came up with it, but yeah, they did. It was like a four or five, five or something. What do, what do you think you would have run at the combine? I think with training, I would have got maybe sub four or five, but probably four or five. It's probably pretty right. Yeah. And so getting drafted in the third round, were you pleased, surprised, happy, sad? All of it. I was, I was all of it because, you know, going on the visits after the combine pro day and, you know, the specific teams like, okay, they like me. Maybe they'll, they'll draft me all of a sudden different receiver before me, different receiver. And, and it's like, it got down to Denver who was at the end of the third round. Like, you know, I got hundreds of family members and friends over like, this is, this isn't going good. And I remember walking down the street, like, God, like obviously a very, very blessed and appreciative of, of even being in consideration, but like, like I need my name called. And so I was surprised because they took Demarius Thomas in the first round. Um, they weren't like, I wasn't high up on their board. I don't think in terms of receivers. And so, uh, but very relieved in the sense that I got the phone call from McDaniels. Um, so you're also in the same draft class as Tim Tebow, correct? Sure was. And yeah. if memory serves me correct, uh, y'all were roommates early on in, uh, in camp. Is that true? That true? Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Our first camp, we, uh, they, they matched the rookies up. Um, and it was me and Tim and his, uh, hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that comes think, with it. Yeah. That yeah, came with now. He, he obviously brought it with, and I just remember him being in it all night, this, this buzzing sound. Like, I'm like, can I get a transfer here? Or I mean, I'll sleep, I'll sleep on the couch in the lobby for God's sake. And uh, I mean, Tim is the most like, just type A like structured. You know, things are going to be done his way. Um, so there was, yeah, there was, there was, it was fun, but it was definitely an experience. Yeah, you know, I've met Tim a couple times, but. To say I know him would be a, a stretch. <clears throat> I have, I, you know, I think a lot of people are curious. I mean, he's obviously loved and and um, well respected. But yeah, what what kind of a football player he is is you can tell he's a passionate guy. But what kind of guy he is, just hanging around watching, uh, you know, Andy Griffith reruns. I, I don't have a clue. And you know, that, that's the thing that. I felt it was hard to get to know him. I mean, I'd ask questions and obviously he's protected because he, he was probably one of the most famous, you know, NCAA college players and, and had this persona that, you know, obviously a very religious and, and just a good guy, which he was, but you know, I'd be like, all right, man, come on, just me and you. Right. Did it happen once or twice in college? Like, uh, come on. Like, you know, like people were flocking all over you, you know, and obviously no, but, you know, from a personal standpoint, just it, it was a little bit more challenging to get um, to really know him. And I always, I guess, compare contrast to Peyton, who 
relationships are everything to him. So the dinners, you know, outside of uh, just work um, on the road, you know, the camaraderie aspect like that to me is, is so important. And that's one thing that, you know, he didn't do as much. And I think he just was probably scared a little bit to go in, out in public and people bother him and whatnot. But I mean, Peyton Manning is just as popular, if not more, like he, he, he found a way to do it. And, um, you know, so again, that was one challenge I felt like as a leader, you have to be that person. You have to, you know, kind of get the team corralled together and really spend that time because it's, it's valuable and translates onto the field. Do you think Tim probably made a mistake not asking you to share a bowl of soup with him and just kind of talk? Yeah, I think we, we could have hashed a lot of things and really got deep over some, some you know, wild rice soup. As I, you know, people want to know, I wanted to do chicken noodle soup because I told, I told Coop I'm a basic, I'm a basic guy here, you know, so but yeah, we had to go one step up and I would have took it with Tim too to go one step into the, into that world. I mean, you're a slow white receiver from Minnesota. You need an edge, my friend. I'm trying to help you. I'm your, I'm your PR guy. How is the soup tasting? Did your wife prepare it? Did you prepare it? Yeah, no, she prepared it. Of course. I can't cook. And I, I actually, so this is a little twist it has a little Southern twist to it. She um, is a raging Cajun. She's from Louisiana. So we got the, yeah, we got the basics in there, but she threw some mushrooms, which, uh, to me is abnormal some tony seasoning a lot of seasoning that went in that i never grew up with everything was bland oh, basic just meat and potatoes Steak, potatoes no butter no salt no pepper just you know green beans off the off the farm i, I have, so it's, it, I have a feeling it's your wife just in so many ways has been a very positive influence on your bland self you really you I mean you know, you got your hat on backwards now. You're wearing a T-shirt. I actually even went. Normally, I wear a coat. I knew you'd be casual, so I even, you know, oh yeah, look at that. We breadwinners in the Decker household. I like that. Yes. <laughs> a little. Now, I will say she's brought everything. some light. She's brought some. Uh, uh, what's what's the adjective I'm thinking of? You know, she's she's uh, she brought some juice. Yeah, some mojo. <laughs> Yeah, some mojo. Some spice, yeah. some flavors, some uh yeah, right. some, spice. Yeah, that's, that's... some Louisiana <laughs> fire. That's it. I love it. Now, how does a guy from Minnesota wind up marrying a country music star? <laughs> you probably a karaoke night that went bad for you that you know she felt sorry for you. I, I got a beautiful voice, Coop, but um <laughs> <laughs> with the little reverb and you know, some, uh, some editing post edit, I can sound good. It was the, it's such an interesting story. I'll try to keep it short, but like I was in Arizona training, it was the lockout year. So I was traveling and like, obviously living it up, being young and having some resources finally. It's like, all right, great. I'm going to, I'm going to do a lot of stuff. And she was on the road at the time living in Nashville. And honestly, the guy I was working out with was, 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 hooking up with this girl. I mean, I don't know if they're dating. Sure. And she's like, oh, I know someone for you. And I'm thinking, great, I'm in Arizona. I'll get to know someone, you know, on a short-term basis. Well, uh, being Jess and we were on the phone texting for a little bit. And then all of a sudden we we would do, at that time, it wasn't FaceTime. I forgot what platform it was, but we, we talked for hours every night. And I just was like so intrigued. And I, I never was a person to open up easy and just kind of indulge my life story. And um, I felt so comfortable with her. And so after a month, we talked for a month. And so really got to know each other from like an emotional standpoint. You know, it wasn't just a physical relationship at that time. And so flew to Nashville. She says it, it was awkward. I said it was great that first weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since then, went back and forth until three months later, I said, you're moving to Denver with me. And so she moved in and, you know, we, we moved kind of quick, I guess, but it was just, it was just crazy timing. Cause I thought I was gonna be single forever. She got a relationship. She thought the same thing and, you know, boom, we, we met and, and the rest is history. And um, the idea of being on a reality show with your wife, how is that? Did you enjoy that? Was it, was that in itself? Uh, a requirement to, to seek some marriage counseling just to try to get through that? Because I know it's those cameras are everywhere and they're in your face. That could be some long days. Yeah, the, the first, I think, couple weeks of it was like challenging the sense of understanding what it was. You got to be on. It is, it is a job in itself. 
Um, but what was great is that like, you know, my wife is like a bulldog. So we had a couple of different pitches from production companies wanting drama or wanting, you know, a certain thing. And she's like, no, this isn't what it is. You know, this, this is the story we want to tell. And so picking the right people was, was the biggest thing. We had the right team, the right camera people. And uh, yeah, there was some long days in terms of shooting certain stuff and you know, having to go back and get another shot of it. Cause obviously it's, it's, it's for TV. And, but it, it, it developed into like kind of a fun platform, you know, and like it created a brand for us that I think still kind of lives to this day and, and, and really is, is true to who we are. So that, that was the biggest thing is, is telling the story that was truthful to like, this is who we are, you know, take it or leave it. And some people loved it. Some people didn't, but it was, it was fun. It was, it was a fun experience. Obviously again, like not something I would say, yeah, that's the first thing I want to do, but um, became long, really lifelong friends with some of these, these crew members, which has been, it's been cool. Now, while you were in football, did you ever, I mean, you know, everybody kind of, as they get further down the road, kind of looks and says, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up knowing this can't last? Did you ever uh, consider getting into coaching or broadcasting? Any of those appeal to you? I did. Uh, once I retired, went and kind of did a few stops at different stations. And um, I don't think I was ready at that point just because, I was ready for just a break and not being on a schedule and, you know, spending some time with kids who are, who at, my kids are young. So really got to spend some beneficial time with them. But yeah, that's like the million dollar question for sure. You know, there's a lot of things that I love or am interested in. Now it's just, as I always say, as an athlete, you know, you're on the, stru the structured schedule, like they tell you what to do. And so not being as proactive sometimes, you know, in this real world now is, is challenging. Like I have to make sure either I have the right people around me or I'm pursuing and, and putting the time in to do what I want to do because no one's going to tell me what to do anymore. I, I have to figure that out. So, you know, that's like right now, the thing I'm going through is, you know, I have all these things that are stimulating or that I want to try out. And it's just a matter of taking that next step and, and getting into it. So coaching is, is something I think, you know, the, the teamwork aspect of it is, is intriguing to me. Um, but I don't think I'd make it ever, ever as a college or professional coach, but in some world, whether that's helping other people out right now, I'm helping Jess with, with Kittenish. So building a team and, and scaling a business is fun. You know, that's coaching. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You know, I think it's a peculiar time in everyone's life when they've played in the NFL, they've obviously earned some, uh, some handsome income, and then you're still a young guy and all of a sudden going, okay, now I'm ready to go into the world. What do I want to do? Because, you're not going to want to go kind of take the low level, horrible job, but at the same time, you know, you're not necessarily qualified to take the higher job and there's kind of this, and then you're known. And then it's just a, it's kind of an interesting uh, puzzling time. And I think a lot of NFL players struggle with coming out of it and, and you still have a, an ego and you're still well known. So you don't want to take something that's beneath you to make you look like you're not successful. It's that's a tough balancing act. It is. It is a balancing act. I think that transition, and I, I went through it like, oh man, I was like, after I'm done, like, great. I don't, I don't really need much. I'm just going to enjoy life. And and at a certain point, you're like, you still need need something. And so it's like, okay, then to your point, what is that? Well, if I want to get into this, I don't have the experience. I don't have the expertise. I need to start at a lower level. It's like, okay, well, how much time do I want to commit? You know, like, I think you got to really map out what that long-term plan is and and then kind of connect the dots and how you get there and just and, and be comfortable with that decision. And so, you know, entrepreneurship has been helpful. I think, again, economically, you're set up where you can do interesting things as well. Like, so like real estate, you know, or just any kind of investment is an opportunity as well. That's not hunkered down time-wise, but, but you can be involved as little or as much as you want. And, you know, there's there's the risk in the, in the teamwork and the stimulation that, you know, make some guys thrive for. Eric, when you were in the NFL, were you around guys in the locker room who are, you know, they're making money, but maybe not hitting the big contracts that are spending their money absolutely insanely. And you're going, this is not going to end well. Yeah. I mean, that's more than you, I can count. You know, it's like, and it's sad because you see it really in like on the plane when you're, you're, you're gambling and playing card games. It's like, 
do you, I mean, there's no concept of like budgeting or the value of a dollar. Like a dollar isn't a dollar, you know, like someone's going to take half that from you, whether it's the government or it's your agent or it's, you know, who, like, so it's, yeah, I think mean, that's a big thing that the NFLPA has gotten better at maybe, but the education aspect of these guys, they think that this money is just going to come forever. You know, it's like, this is their lifestyle. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. And then do you ever find that the players that are probably more unprepared to handle money and this newfound fame and, you know, kind of responsibility, do they lean on peers or do they lean on people that are smarter and been around and know what's going on and going, man, I know I don't know what I'm doing, but I bet he does. Maybe I ought to align myself with this veteran who seems to be making a ton of money, but still driving a pickup truck. Yeah. It's case by case basis. I wish that was the, the thought process. And I wish that was like drilled in, you know, at a young age, even, you know, in high school, I feel like that's something that can be, can be looked at, you know, like, how do you, how do you spend money and what, what are the consequences, you know, because that, that's obviously what drives everything in this world. And so it's, yeah, it's to the point where you, you know, the young guys and when I became a veteran, you know, making that a priority in the receiver room for me is talking to these guys, but listen, like you make good money, but you got to make good choices. You can easily blow $50,000 at the club on ball service, but what, what, what kind of return are you going to get on that? Like, you know, you can go on and spend, Three hundred dollars on a date night with a girl, you can get the same thing you're you're trying to get at the club. Like it's you know it's it's uh, choices for sure that you try to teach them. Back to Tebow, what did Tebow? How did Tebow throw in that first practice? When y'all watching him throw, was it a little bit? I, I'm sure that the cameras and the interest level was at an all time high. No one even cared about that third round draft pick. They just wanted to see what number fifteen did. What did he throw like? Threw hard, hard, and. Um, and it was, it was never really tight, you know, it, was, it always had a little wobble, but he, he was always, I'll, I'll go back to the off season program. I mean, he was out running skilled players and I mean, he, he would last, his endurance was insane. Like this guy was an animal, you know, as far as workouts and you get to practice, same thing. He's out there 45 minutes before breaking fingers on the equipment guy's hands. Um, but the one story I always tell is, you know, we had to kind of modify, by our like three-step drop, uh, which in essence is like the quarterback takes three steps and throws it. You go about six yards and the ball should be there. Well, we had to take it to like 10 yards because it didn't get out on time. So we, we definitely modified our, 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 uh, our package. I was always curious about that because Tim is such a good athlete. He was obviously so successful, but you know, even, you know, when he was in the NFL, they were trying, he has that big dip. And they were trying to fix it. And I was kind of always curious why no one ever said, I guess they were winning and didn't want to screw it up. At some point you say, Tim, this is not, you know, going to serve you well in the long haul. You can try to relearn things in your twenties is meaningfully harder than doing things at, you know, 16, 17, 18. So um, yeah, he's got a big, a big loop. Yeah. It just took, it took a little bit longer to get out. And obviously, as you know, I mean, the NFL is so quick, quick and, that's everything. Um, and then how are you feeling now? I know you've had surgeries. Tell me how many surgeries you've had. Are you, are you beat up? You, you look fine, but do you feel, feel okay? I feel good, but I've had my fair share for sure. I think that was truthfully one of the reasons I wanted to get out to. I just was kind of mentally like exhausted from season rehab, season rehab. So I, I have, I've had one, I've had my foot, my knee, my hip, my shoulder, all repaired, and um, obviously multiple injuries on top of that. But that was for sure just a driving factor of you know you just get you get wore out mentally. Like obviously I love the game and uh, there's nothing like it, but you can only take so much emotionally and mentally. Um, and, and I've took my fair share even through college too. I mean, every year I felt like I got a major major injury or something I was dealing with. It sucked. Well, I know you can only take so much more of me mentally and physically. But thank you so much for joining me for a little bowl of soup. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to hanging with you soon at the Corner Pub in Nashville. Uh, well, we got to get back and get, get a date on the schedule, all right? I'm, I appreciate having I'm you. getting thirsty just uh, just sipping this soup. So let's go have a few soon. Thanks, Abe. Uh, appreciate it, buddy. Good.
Yep. 